Mac Dre from San Francisco Bay. Controversial lyricist. He was known as Mr. Too Hard for the radio. Too hard! He lived by that, and he died by that. Convicted criminal. They were using the, the robberies to finance their rap careers. Underground music icon. He still the king of the back. But on tour away from home. I knew that was going to be trouble. He would be the target of a brutal highway shooting. Cats came on and started gunning. By 2004, rapper Matt Dre had become a Bay Area hip-hop pioneer and a local hero on the verge of blowing up on the national stage. I would definitely say probably the most famous unsigned artist the Bay Area ever had. People would make copies of a CD or a cassette and literally sell them from their cars, sell them on the street. And you could become a, a quote-unquote star and never have to leave your neighborhood. <laughs> While out on tour, Mac Dre found himself on the wrong side of a gun barrel. Well before he was the king of Bay Area rap, Mac Dre was born Andre Hicks, July 5th, 1970. He was a handful, just like his mother. <laughs> and I think early on, he knew exactly who he was and what he wanted to do. The family moved to Northern California and a small city in Solano County, about 25 minutes from Oakland, and settled in East Vallejo. Which is a middle-class neighborhood, and he was anything but a gangster but he liked to associate with the gangsters in the Crest. Crest is one of a couple of black areas in Vallejo. For people that's out here, it's just a place that you really had no business being in unless you knew folks. Despite Wanda's best efforts to shield her son from the more dangerous elements of Vallejo, the draw was too strong for young Andre. He started going to Country Club Crest because that's where his friends were. At the time, uh, that area was known to have some problems, some crimes. I didn't understand at the time why he would leave the neighborhood we lived in, the neighborhood that I worked hard to make sure that he saw a different side of life. He chose to go there. The friends that he made became known as the Romper Room, a tight-knit crew living in the Crest. My partner Jamie 08 gave us the name. He'll be across the street and see us all hanging out. Look at them over there, the romper room. I see Coolio. Like he used to act like Miss Nancy from the romper room show. I see Coolio. I see Mac Dre. I see EB. I see Kilo. And so he saying these names. So we flipping him off. The name stuck. And so we, we embraced it after that. Andre formed an unbreakable bond with the guys in the romper room crew. You grew up in the crest. You don't have friends, you have cutties. It's more than a friend. It is like a relative. It's like a cousin and a buddy. To the youngsters in the romper room, the hustle of the streets offered up an alluring lifestyle. The group hung out selling dope, hustling, drinking, and partying down on the weekends. 16, 17, 18, just in that short span, those little three, four years, we had a bond that was super tight. The late 80s was the golden age of rap, and Dre was immersed in the sounds of the street. And while he spent his days kicking it in the crest, he quickly graduated to writing rhymes and perfecting his flow. I didn't realize until I went to a high school talent show. When he went on stage, people went crazy. He started rapping and everybody got up. For him, it was validation that what I'm doing is the right thing. The timing was perfect. Disco was dying and a fresh style of urban sound was making its way from New York to LA and everywhere in between, including the Bay Area. But the Bay did it its own way. Bay Area music scene is unlike any other scene really in the world in the sense that it's its own world. Real scrap and, and grind and hustle type of mentality. 
And that's because the Bay Area doesn't get the attention that New York does. It's not the big media market that way. And L.A. is its own thing, and the Bay doesn't want to be like L.A. In 1988, Andre hooked up with one of Alejo's early pioneers, Michael the Mac Robinson, who became his mentor and inspired him to adopt his own persona, Mac Dre. A Mac comes from the idea of uh, a player becomes this sort of pre-name for, you know, whoever you are um, as an artist. And then, of course, Dre relates to his name. His name was Andre Hicks, so Mac Dre. Easy, done. This is who I am. I'm the man. In 1989, just shy of 18 years old, Mac Dre recorded and released a cassette tape with a local producer titled Young Black Brother. Young black brother could never be another. He keep the joint one hand, the heme in the other, so fly. Could never seem bummy. He never had a job, but keeps a pocket full of money. He captured just us, the vibe of young black males at that time in the country club crest. Dre's ability to turn the vivid stories of life in the crest into rap songs made him a local hero. Dre was coming up, you know, it was radio was real, real strict. A lot of stuff you hear on the radio, you really didn't hear back in the day. So his thing was, I'm not even going to radio. To emphasize that point, his follow-up song was explicitly titled, Too Hard for the F***ing Radio. The song just caught fire in the streets. It was passed around to everybody, you know, and, and it, was a, it, was, it was really a big song in the Bay Area. His shocking lyrics garnered the attention of the Bay, and Mac Dre became an underground sensation. He would say, you don't understand, Ma. People know who I am. It's like, you know, Andre, really, please. <laughs> but lo and behold, we used to go in record stores like Out of State and see Mac Dre albums. And wow, you know, it's like, you know, really, yeah, you, you might be on something here. While Mac Dre was busy rocking crowds, the Romper Room gang was making headlines in the streets. I think when you came from these certain areas, your neighborhood is, is not only your initial fan base, but in many ways, they're your, they're your support. The gang began knocking off pizza parlors, often at gunpoint. This crew was out of the crest. They would go in uh, when they knew there was a lot of cash. They would fire shots to make people listen to what they had to say. We're going all around. All right, all around. Yeah, it's adrenaline rush. First actual time. I didn't go in. I drove. There's guys, you know, will go to a local gangster and get some money to make their demo. It could be debatable whether all the money was legal money or not. They were using the, the robberies to finance their rap careers. But soon the romper room gang moved from pizza parlors to bigger heists. And when law enforcement closes in, Matt Dre gets dragged into the middle. By the 1990s, San Francisco Bay Area rapper Mac Dre's fame was on the rise. But his association with the local robbers, known as the Romper Room Gang, threatened to derail his career. They had a fairly good run at robbing those pizza parlors, but ultimately they graduated to robbing banks. You know, teenage kid, you know, sitting in the car waiting, I'm thinking, is they really robbing a bank? Like, are they pulling my leg? Is this a joke? But I'm with it, <laughs> whatever it is. If they for real, I'm with it too. Let's see if they for real. So once they come back with the money and say, go, I'm gone. Like, is this still for real? I'm still thinking it's a joke until we get to where we got to get to. There's actual cash there. Police would discover stolen cars within a block or two of the robberies. And as the money started to add up, authorities were able to trace the evidence back to the crest. While there was no proof that Dre was directly involved, the association between Dre's record label, Romp Productions, and his many references to the Romper Room gang in his songs led them to suspect the money was being used to finance his music career. So now once they see Mac Dre making the music, oh, he must be the one who's behind this. Police began beefing up surveillance on the crest and coming down hard on members of the Romper Room crew. At that time, in the late 80s, early 90s, we started hearing about the police wrestling up a lot of black men in the crest. 
and the police took a special interest in Dre. He was a known figure out here in the Bay Area, a rapper that everybody was looking up to, and, and he was really on pace to, to, to blow. Like, this was at a time when record labels was ready to come in and sign Dre. Despite his affiliation with a romper room, those closest to Dre knew he kept his hands clean. They tore into Dre like, you know, like it was like you wouldn't believe. It was pure harassment. Dre never robbed a bank. He didn't have to. He was rapping. They sweated his, his mom unbelievably, like everything you can imagine they did. They'll pull up and call us by our names, our nicknames, like, hey Coolio, Mac Dre. You guys been scouting banks lately? Tired of the harassment from the Vallejo police, Mac Dre retaliated the best way he knew how, with his music. He did a song called Punk Police, which was our version of F the Police. The song recounted his association with the romper room and even declared on the record his innocence for everyone to hear. Dre wasn't a bank robber, so he felt like it was OK for him to tell the police, hey, you know, f you. You know, y'all y'all sweating me behind something I ain't even doing. This was uh, a groundbreaking record because he did two things. One, he talked about the police and he put it in perspective and kind of let everybody know what was happening. But he did something nobody had ever done before. He called out the police by name. I remember I told him, you need to really be careful because this could get you into a lot of trouble. You could make them mad. There could be consequences, and there were. When you start thumbing your nose at law enforcement, it's going to cause some extra consideration and investigation and putting it a higher priority than if you low-key it. As the bank robberies continued, the Vallejo Police Department reached out to the FBI, who assembled the Vallejo Violence Suppression Task Force. When the FBI stepped into this case, they were able to devote significant resources to uh, pursuing members of the romper room game. The FBI started gathering intelligence on the crest with heavy surveillance in an attempt to identify potential suspects. Of course, you had uh, bank surveillance footage where you could identify some aspects of them, not enough to charge them, but there was good enough intelligence to know that it was this particular group of people from this area. Meanwhile, Mac Dre's reputation was spreading beyond the Bay, and in March of 92, he shared billing at a show in Fresno with Ice Cube. It was one of his biggest shows to date, and Dre took members of the romper room along with him. That was my first time in Fresno. Actually, it was all our first time in Fresno. And at the time, all the bank robberies was happening in the Bay Area, so the Bay Area was getting real hot with bank robberies, so it was time to take my show on the road. So when I was in Fresno, I was already planning on, hey, this is a good place for me to come down and hit a lick. Once back in Vallejo, Jay Diggs, a romper room member, decided to make another trip to Fresno. But this time, it was to rob a bank. What Jay Diggs didn't know was that the FBI was hot on his trail. The morning I was going back, I just so happened to be at Dre's house. And me and Dre was working on some songs. And I, you know, I'm telling Dre I'm finna leave and go to Fresno. And he's like, man, I wanna go. I'm like, nah, Dre, you need to stay here. Like, well, I could stay at the hotel. Plus, I met this little chick out there. So at the end of the day, I'm like, all right, come on, you know. So Mac Dre heads south to Fresno with romper room gang members Jay Diggs, his cousin Kilo Kurt, and a car thief named Corey. Next morning, it's me and Kilo. We leave Mac Dre at the hotel. I tell Dre we'll be back in about an hour. He was with a female friend. Everything was set up pretty much perfect, what I thought. <laughs> From the time we get to the bank, it's just something not feeling right. I'm seeing these cars. We always associated these cars with the Fed. My little cousin, Kilo, he's the same way. Like, man, it's, you keep seeing these funny little cars. I'm like, I don't know. But at the time, you know, we like, you know, we finna do it anyway. I get ready to put on my mask. I'm like, come on, okay, let's do this. Before I even put my foot on the ground, like I never even get out the car, I notice across the street, it's a news van. I'm talking to Kilo, I'm like, man, you see this van over here? Windows is kind of distorted a little bit. Like they, you know, could like it could be somebody looking out, but you can't see in. So we putting all this together. I'm like, man, I'm not feeling right now. So we shut it down. But Corey, my driver, he's still trying to egg it on. Come on, man, you know, I'm like, nah, let's go. So we go back to the hotel, and we go pick up Dre. We on the Highway 99 North going back to the Bay Area. A car passed by. Now, I'm sitting in the driver's seat. 
and I'm facing Matt Dre, and his face like he's seen a ghost. Matt Dre noticed a Vallejo police detective drive by, well outside his jurisdiction. Something not right. I'm not feeling this. So what I did, instead of going straight on the freeway, I smashed across the intersection of the freeway, went across the medium, and went the other way. But when I did that, it looked like every car on the freeway did it. I had about 30 FBI's agents following me. They all start peeling off the freeway. They all start turning behind. That's when we realized you know, they was on to us. But FBI agents weren't just on their tail. They had an informant in the crew as well. Matt Dre, San Francisco Bay Area's most notorious underground rapper, is leaving Fresno with his crew after an aborted bank robbery attempt. Little did they know, one of the crew was working for the feds, who were listening in on their every word. The backbone of the FBI is source development. The FBI did develop a, an excellent source that was close to the Romper Room gang and Matt Dre. The source the FBI had developed was the crew's car thief and driver, Corey, he's the rat. I thought he was a friend of mine. He told the police officers that I know the people that's behind the robbers. We've got good, hard intelligence on the people that were behind some of the bank robberies. On the way back from Fresno, the FBI swooped in and arrested Jamal Diggs, Kilo Kurt, and Mac Dre. And they arrest us, and it takes us back to Fresno County Jail, and they charge us with conspiracy and attempted bank robbery. Conspiracy is the planning. Attempt, they said we took substantial enough steps to be called an attempt robbery. And to create a conspiracy, all you need is to uh, have knowledge of the plan and in some way participate in the plan. If they even mention robbing a bank and Dre in a car, that's enough to give you a conspiracy because they feel, well, why you didn't call the police if you knew something was going to happen? I remember calling him and saying, this is what's on the news. Is it true? And I remember crying, and I remember screaming on the phone. And he said to me, Mom, I swear that I had nothing to do with this. There was something in his tone. There was something in the way he said it. And so even if he didn't intend to ever step foot in that bank, he still exposed himself to this conspiracy charge. And based upon the recordings they had, the FBI developed what is relatively a strong case against him. The feds offered Matt Dre a deal to avoid jail time by testifying against the other members of the crew. They was trying to tell him, all you gotta do is just say you wasn't there and these guys were gonna do this. You go home. I'm not going home. <laughs> I'm going to sit here with them, because they didn't do nothing either. The move cost him bail, and he was forced to sit in a Fresno County jail while awaiting trial. He was still in denial and still immature to where he didn't understand the impact. He didn't believe that he was going to go to prison, number one. He could have done a plea bargain, but I remember he decided not to because I'm innocent. Why do I need to plea bargain? I didn't do it. There was no way he was going to snitch on anybody from the crest and that really solidified for his audience that he was true to the game but when we went to court i mean they used everything they had lyrics they played those lyrics in court and they used those lyrics and and during that time rap music was fairly new on police he said i'm gonna laugh in your face and kick on back and feel the bass in court, they convinced the jury that he said, I'm going to kick back and fill the banks. Saying he's going to rob more banks. Like, he didn't, clearly didn't say that. They believed the stuff that he was saying. And then when he got found guilty, he couldn't believe it. But they found him guilty. Has the jury reached a verdict? Guilty. He get found guilty, and they say he's about to do five years. He was devastated. He was crushed. On March 12, 1993, 22-year-old Matt Dre, the biggest rap artist in the Bay, on the verge of becoming a national star, was sent to Lompoc Federal Penitentiary for conspiring to rob a bank. He sucked it up and he went 
for five years. At that time, that took Mac Dre to even more heights. He became even more determined, even to the point where he did a record from jail. I could do this over the phone, man. From prison, Mac Dre continued to write. He recorded his lyrics over the prison payphone, compiling songs for what would become the Back in the Hood EP, a collection of classics about his early years, his innocence, and life behind bars. He's telling you about his case on these songs. He was the first person to record a record in jail over the phone. You couldn't stop Dre. His fans ate it up. Even though it was over the phone, it was still Mac Dre, and it was still dope. Five years later, Mac Dre would emerge from prison, and he'd be hotter than ever. But on a fateful trip to the Midwest, everything would come apart. Even while locked up, Matt Dre had made an indelible mark on the world of rap, recording an entire album he would call Back in the Hood over the prison phone. On August 2nd, 1996, the 26-year-old rapper was released from prison and emerged a very different artist from the one who had been put away just five years earlier. Fuck the law, the law won. I've been going since 91 did the time like a soldier, came out, and where some people might be jaded, he wasn't jaded. He had a sense of urgency about him, like he had to do it, you know, and he came back, a man was bigger than, than when he left. He learned that this is a business, and he came out deciding that he was gonna have his own label. He was going to stay independent. Let me tell you why we call it this thing stupid. Because when I dance, the chicks say, you still In 1997, Dre founded Romp Records as a vehicle to showcase the best hip-hop the Bay had to offer. And he would not only be the owner, he was the label's marquee talent and quickly got to work. Within that first couple of weeks, we was in the studio recording the Rompilation, which is one of the biggest selling independent Bay albums to this day. For us to come home, and jump back into this music game and then become icons in this music and being looked up to and now everybody's screaming our name in a different way. That's a beautiful feeling. The way he got embraced when he came back to the Bay Area, it was just like, you would have thought he was already a megastar. He embraced it like, let's go. After the rompilation, Dre recorded music at a breakneck pace. And by 2000, with a strong following in the Bay, radio stations could no longer ignore the street icon. In 2001, he left Vallejo for Sacramento and began a run of productivity, releasing 10 solo albums in six years. Every day he was in the studio. Every day he, he, he would go to a studio in two studios in Oakland and go back to Sacramento and hit two other studios. When he wasn't working on his own music, he was doing uh, guest, guest appearances on other people's records. He had a vision about taking this independent label of his and helping others. He wanted everybody to have a little piece, you know? He wanted the, the guys that he thought were talented and, you know, nobody else might have believed in to give these guys a chance. And I think that's where the respect comes from, from fans, because he talked about that. He was trying to add to that, to the legacy of what was Bay Area hip hop. But rather than exploit his gangster image, Dre began to experiment with different styles. And he even helped pioneer a whole new movement known as hyphy. Doing what we want to, hanging out the sunroof, mentally ignorant. He was like no other person. Like, whatever he wanted to do, that's what he wanted. If he wanted to wear his hair out wild, if he wanted to wear his socks up to his knees, you know, but he was still a cool, cool cat. And, and he really had a way with dealing with his fans. His lyrics changed from the negative, being in prison, and what it was like to having fun. Everywhere we go, it's a party, y'all. We gon' get it cracking like the Mardi Gras. The term hyphy would go on to represent a style of music and dance synonymous with Bay Area hip hop. A combination of the words hyper and fly, hyphy was to the Bay Area what crunk was to the South. Gritty, fast paced dance music associated with partying and having a good time. Hyphy comes out of primarily car culture in Oakland, and you had a sideshow, uh, which was our word for cruising. 
And with the Nets Hide Show came very specific activities that people did with their cars, a lot of donuts and peeling, and this is going on. A word gets attached to a certain type of behavior, being rambunctious and kind of amped up and ready to, you know, kick up dust, like we're hyphy, okay? And then a soundtrack gets attached to it. I'm amped, feeling good, feeling good. I'm hyphy in a bitch face with the this face off of Nike. Hyphy is what we did and how we act. Hyphy is a feeling. When this whole hyphy movement started, he started dressing the way I dressed when he was younger. And now all of a sudden, because other people are asking him about what he's wearing, and they started to wear what he was wearing or wanting to, all of a sudden it became cool. Here's this guy who is now the leader of this whole new emergence of Bay Area rappers, and people are like, this is the new guy. And it's like, but he's, he's not the new guy, that's, that's Mac Dre. During this time, Dre also changed the name of his record label. Romp Records became Fizz Entertainment. A not so subtle reference to the controversial party drug ecstasy. And you know, and that was just a little craze that was surfaced around Dre. One of the bigger records that, you know, hit huge for Mac Dre after prison was this dance. Bounce to the beat till it start to hurt. Then I dust on the smirk off me shirt. Then I dip to the ground as I catch the bass. Then I wipe all the sweat off me face. And that was like an anthem because it was all about, you know, the moves that he made when he was performing. Fans were connecting not only to the unique sound of Thiz, but also to Matt Dre's performance style and personality. I do everything till I pop. He was more than just a rapper. He was a true entertainer. When he would walk in the room, he would light it up. You would want to hear what he said, where he was going to eat. Dre had cultivated a loyal fan base in major cities across the country. And his popularity was soaring. They were hugely popular in markets like Kansas City, St. Louis, Chicago. This was a business for him at this point. And so he understood that going to shows, live shows, just drew more fans. The women like me, I'm dipped in butter. I'll rob your butter, pimp the blood out your mother. I'm Mr. Stupid Doodle Dumb. Some terrible, tell him how we come. All the stuff that he had talked about and wrote about while he was in prison, he was living his dream. Come on, come on. Repeat after me, we go S T U P I D. And his star power was on the upswing as he toured, especially in Kansas City. I'm the first person to take him to Kansas City in 1999. So this is the first time that Drake was ever out there. And they treat them presidential too. And even the guy who I was dealing with, he said, man, y'all bigger than P. Diddy out here to us. Y'all bigger than, you know, any artist that's out right now. So once Dre got a dose of that, he started going back more and more and more building a relationship to where it was almost, that was his second home. And in 2004, Mac Dre and several of his Vallejo crew headed back to Kansas City to headline a show in the city he knew so well. They got us in $3,000 suites. Honestly, like, oh, y'all stars out here, y'all. You know, so that's how much love Kansas City had for us. Little did they know that trip would end tragically. In late October 2004, Bay Area rapper Matt Dre heads to Kansas City, where he enjoys a large Midwest fan base. Before we went to Kansas City, we was doing shows. We, we did Portland, we did Seattle. Kansas City was just another day. But for Dre, it was also a homecoming, as they headlined packed shows. Kansas City got a lot of love for us. They've been supporting us since the beginning. So we, you know, going around, making our rounds, eating food. I remember doing the show, dope crowd, everybody loved us. Do the last show. I remember being in the limo. He like, man, uh, we, we getting out first thing in the morning, you know? So I'm like, cool. So we ain't going out tonight. So we all got out the car. My room is right across from his. Come back to my room. I'm laying down. I'm thinking like, you got a flight to catch in the morning. We out of here. But despite his best intentions to turn in early, Dre is still wound up from the night and decides to blow off steam at a local club. It's the early morning of November 1st, 2004. Mac Dre leaves the nightclub and is traveling north on Highway 71 near 85th Street with his driver, 
A dark colored infinity uh, pulled alongside of the van that Mac Gray was traveling in. Cats came on and started gunning. Start gunning on the van. The driver lost control. Man, they shot for him. But during the course of that, Mac Dre was ejected from the vehicle. The driver then leaves the van trying to get help, calls 911, and uh, EMS responds. The first responders come immediately. When they found Mac Dre, uh, it became obvious that he did not die from the crash. He was killed directly by a bullet entering the back of his neck. Mac Dre lies on an empty stretch of road on a Kansas night, while the rest of the Thiz crew is back at the hotel, resting for an early morning flight. And I get a call, like five in the morning or something, man, and say the Cuddy got hit. I already knew who he was talking about. It was just like, like I was dreaming, man. It was just sounded crazy to me, and I didn't believe it, I didn't believe it. But I knew, I knew it was real. I couldn't believe it, because it was just like, dude got stole from us, you know what I mean? He got stole from us. I got a call from my nephew that he had been shot. I was on my way to work, and I remember, and I said, I don't believe it. And I just kept driving on my way to work. And I said, I've heard stuff like this before, I've heard rumors before, and I don't believe it. Like, we had just went through a Mac Dre death rumor. And Dre had to go on the radio. and was like, I'm still here. Yeah, that, that I'm, you know, I'm still alive. And here it is, it's deja vu, the same thing. He like, Cuddy. He like, they killed Dre in Kansas City last night. It's like a brick wall at first, and then it's, it, once I sat down, it just hit me. Like, I could just tears and everything came out, like, you know, so it was devastating. I had to call my boss and say, I can't come to work. My, my son has been killed. And for me to say those words and to accept those words, I, I, I can't describe. They knew he was in that vehicle. They knew the direction he was traveling in. They were probably tailing him. And when the time was right, when nobody else was around, they sped up alongside and fired. This was clearly a premeditated murder. What the reason behind it was is unclear. And as it unfolded, you know, got shot in a van. They found him on the side of the road. When I started to have visions and picturing all of that and wondering what was in his mind when it happened and picturing that he was alone on the side of the freeway. I mean, it just, it just became, it, it just was overwhelming. I jumped on a plane immediately, went straight to Kansas City. And uh, a lot of my homeboys was already over there. So my whole thing was just to go over there and just, man, just find out what happened. When he died, uh, we waited for his, for his body to get sent back home before we left Kansas City. We came together, we lead together. The grief that came with Mac Dre's violent death was never ending. And neither was the rage. You want to go do something. Like, somebody got to pay right now. Right now, though. You know, that's the fire you have in you. Like, right now, somebody got to go pay. As the investigation of the tragic night uncovers a possible motive, word filters back to the crew in Vallejo. Somebody would pay for the murder of Mac Dre. After the tragic loss of Bay Area underground rap legend Mac Dre, his friends, family, and fans demanded answers. Who gunned him down in the early hours of November 1st, 2004? There were suspicions that a Kansas City rapper named Fat Tone Watkins may have been involved. If Dre was the intended target, what motivation could there have been for Watkins to kill Mac Dre? The two had performed together at a recent concert. 
Investigators looked into an alleged altercation between their two camps. Police quickly cleared Watkins' name. Though Watkins reportedly enjoyed the attention, he would later deny any involvement in his track, My Hood Betrayed Me. But not everyone was convinced that Watkins was innocent. Associates of Mac Dre came up with a plan to settle the score. On May 23, 2005, seven months after Dre's killing, Fat Tone Watkins' body was found riddled with bullets, gunned down in a Las Vegas suburb. It was deemed a retaliatory hit for the death of Mac Dre when two Vallejo men, Andre Mac Minister Dow and Jason Mathis, were convicted of the murder. They were both sentenced to life in prison. With the two men behind bars, police were no closer to solving Dre's murder. Fans across the Bay Area and the country wondered if justice would ever be served. Police says we haven't caught who's responsible for it. But we know who the suspect is. The way I grew up, I don't expect no police to help us with nothing. I don't think they really even tried to find out who killed Dre. This is what the police still says to this day, that an arrest will be made in this case. It's nine years. But at some point, the streets know. And then you let the streets, you know, handle the streets the way the streets handle business. With no suspects and little evidence, the murder of Mac Dre remains unsolved to this day. Back in Vallejo, Dre's family decided to hold a public viewing to allow fans and friends alike to pay their respects to the fallen Bay Area icon. It was from 8, 9 o'clock in the morning to 5 in, in the evening. There were people in line to see him for all those hours. The line never stopped. When Dre died, I think the whole world expressed it. Dre had the ability to mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. And I just watched these people come through and express how my son impacted their lives. It was overwhelming, and to this day, it still is. Mac Dre also left a towering musical legacy. If you ask, what's, what's up with the bay? They gonna say Mac Dre. That's just it, you feel me? That's it, man. And even though he gone, he's still the king of the bay. I see little kids right now that it wasn't even born when Dre died, and they do Dre dances and sing his songs and, and mimic Mac Dre. You gotta get into it, growl like a bear. Members of the music industry also paid homage to Dre. Every rapper from the game to Ice Cube to Too Short to uh, 50 Cent and his crew, you know, everybody was saying something about Mac Dre. Drake even singled out Mac Dre in the lyrics of his hit song, The Motto, with a video that features a cameo from Dre's mother, Wanda. Shout out to Drake for rapping for the cut. you know what I mean? I, we respect that, you feel me? We respect that. When I say Mac, say Dre, Mac, Dre, Mac, Dre. While a who's who of hip hop pays its respects in lyrics, Mac Dre's personal legacy is what his friends and family most remember. His heart was open to anybody. It didn't matter to him. And his message was hope for everybody and anybody. It just didn't matter. He touched people. I just didn't realize how many people he touched. I, I didn't realize. But it's been nine, almost 10 years. It hasn't stopped. At the end of the day, dude is my, dude is my friend. And all this music, all this means nothing, man. That's my friend. I want my friend back. I'm feeling like he's here with me right now, just laughing, like, get him, Cooley. Because that's what he'd tell me. I was blessed to, to have worked with him, to know him, and still have him in my heart. I'm not wearing this for TV. Anybody that know me know I wear Dre every day of my life. Like, that's just what I do. This chain been around my neck since Dre died.
dude will live forever, man, with his music and in the heart of all his fans. And I think about his determination, and I think about how he overcame so much and where he could have been and what he accomplished. He was fearless. To this day, it motivates me. And a lot of times I tell myself when I'm afraid, I do it for him.